You're listening to That's Pretty Dark. The podcast where we talk about all of the entertainment that scared us as children and still haunts us as adults. So grab your flashlight and join us as we take a frightfully nostalgic look over our shoulders and under our beds and in our closets. And together we'll realize, well, that's pretty that's dark. Pretty dark. Two thousand twenty-two. Here We're we are. Feeling twenty twenty-two. Oh my gosh! Wow. <laughs> Run for your lives, everybody. Oops. We got. <laughs> the, we're clearly. We don't have anything together nothing, yet, but we're trying really hard. Together. Omicron's after us. Is that how you say it? Omicron. Yeah. Omicron. Omicron's after it's us. Greek letters. You know, you just you just gotta hide. Do your best. I've been hiding. You know, I've been hiding. I haven't left my house, and other than going to the emergency room, I haven't left my house. <laughs> yeah. So after we recorded last oh, yeah. on New Year's Day, you had to go to the ER. Yes, the day of the episode. So when you guys were getting that last campfire chat, I was in the emergency room. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a rough start to the new year for me. New Year's Eve sucked really bad because I was just like very ill, and then um, I got up on New Year's Day and promptly passed out. (laughs) And so I ended up in the ER for um, the first day of the new year. But I did get to go home that night and I've been doing okay since then. And great news for anybody following my case, (laughs) um, my biopsy came back negative. Truly didn't expect it. Christian and I rejoiced for like two days. I'm rejoicing. I I mean, it was really hard to be going through the complications with the added like fear of the biopsy. Yeah. So. That part is great. I'm still recovering, though, from the procedure itself. And clearly, my body hates me. But it doesn't hate me as bad as it could hate me. I give you a slow clap, but we don't have time for that. (laughs) Sure we do. We have all the time in the world. We have as much time as we want. (laughs) This is is our world. I know. We are creating it. So you have to run from cancer. Run from cancer, run from Omicron. And from molds and Omicron. And most importantly, we have to run from... Monkey cat. Oh, monkey cat. Yes, we do. I would run from monkey cat. Terrified of monkey cat. If I just saw a monkey cat out there in the wild, you bet, better believe mm-hmm. it. I'd be What was gone. it, a cat's body with a monkey's head? Is that what it is? I think it's a monkey's body with a cat's head, actually. We'll agree to disagree. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you just watched it more recently <laughs> than me, so I'll, I'll go. I didn't, I didn't put that part in my notes, but I did oh, make yeah. a note <laughs> to uh, laugh about the Frankenstein... Uh, connection. One of the things I remembered most about it was Monkey Cat. I was That's like, so oh, great. Yeah. yeah, Monkey Cat. Well, if you don't remember Monkey Cat, this episode of That's Pretty Dark Monkey Cat. is going to be focusing on the Hey Arnold episode, The Headless Cabby. Headless Cabby. We're headless all about cabby. losing our heads and telling stories about I know, people. I know. It's so weird. But before we get started, I have to show you what I'm wearing. So my sister lives in uh, North Carolina now, and she sent me a Christmas present. Tell me, Kaylin. Tell me, tell me, Christian, she your co host. Me. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I understand what you're doing now. Those are I our names. It. Okay, yeah, I'm Kaylin. Yes, you are. Um, my co-host name is Christian, as That's you right. mentioned. 2022, episode Ooh. 14. Um, I have a sister named Carrie, <laughs> and she sent me a Christmas present, which I'm wearing right now. It's a sweatshirt. Yeah. And I'm about to show Christian what it says. Written and directed by DJ McHale. Yeah, your life story. That's awesome. <laughs> this sweatshirt says written and directed by DJ McHale. That's dope. She has been listening to the podcast and thought it would be appropriate. So that's really cool. That's pretty cool. That's really cool. I told cool. her I'd wear it next time we recorded. And here we are. Yeah. Did she get it custom made or did she find it? I think it? she got it on Etsy. That's really amazing. Maybe I'll, if I we can post it, I'll tag the um, the artist or the person yeah. that she got it from Heck on Etsy. Yeah. But yeah. That's cool. cool. Pretty cool. Lucky you. I know. Wear it proudly. So back to (laughs) the headless cabbie. The headless cabbie. Like you said, we've just had a lot of decapitation (laughs) on the show over the last few episodes. great. And the headless cabbie kind of combines elements of the headless horseman and elements of the green ribbon that you just covered. Yeah. So I think it's cool that we're kind of putting this all together. Lots of crossovers. It's it's definitely sticks in my mind. As we were talking about the Green Ribbon, it made me want to watch this episode. Yeah. So I hope that this is a coherent episode because I did most of these notes while I was in that like biopsy anxiety mindset. Yeah, you're pretty out um, of it. I reread them before we started just to make sure that they they make sense. I think they do. Yeah. We'll give you a pass. Hopefully, hopefully you can follow along with me. And there are just so many directions that I could take it because of the connections to the Green Ribbon, the Headless Horseman, everything. Yeah. 
But I've got a ton of really fun, like, Hey Arnold behind the scenes stuff for you. Yes. That I'm excited about. Our debut Hey Arnold episode. Yes. I read several interviews. Um, so I'll be able to kind of intersperse quotes from the cast and crew. And so that's that's exciting, too. Nice. And like you said, this is the first time that we're explicitly covering a Hey Arnold episode. I know that we've mentioned it here and there, right. but this is the first time that we've dedicated an episode to Hey Arnold. So this is going to be fun. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty pumped. It's going to be a good time. Because there's like a there's a handful of like spooky special Halloween special type episodes mm-hmm. for Hey Arnold. They did a bunch of Halloween and like very eerie kind of creepy episodes they sure did that are fun in their own hey ronald kind of way i have kind of a list a little bit later but there was like the um there's a few the one where they got stuck on the subway Mm -hmm. (laughs) there was like there were just a bunch of like urban legend type of episodes yeah the one in this like uh episode uh cluster the other one is friday the 13th friday the 13th so yes It's really cool. And that one I always remember too. They just, these just seem to shine. I don't know if it was because I went back to this one so much. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of my favorite ones. This one and the alien invasion, of course, but we'll get to that one Yes, I mentioned that too. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to some of those. But this is my favorite one. This is also my favorite Hey Arnold episode and that's saying something. Hell yeah. Uh, My personal connection to Hey Arnold, it runs very, very deep. (laughs) Uh, I think I've mentioned on the show that this was my favorite cartoon as a kid. Yeah. I I never was much one for an animation in most respects yeah. i don't really like i know i'm gonna get a lot of Just hate for this. i don't really like adult animation losing listeners. not an anime person but hey arnold something about hey arnold was just in that sweet spot for me and i think it was a combination of having that like mature elevated dialogue and like story structure mm-hmm. but also it was gritty but it wasn't gross out right and that was a key distinction for me like in terms of what i prefer clean grit it was yeah it was gritty but it, it didn't have like the run and stimpy gross out factor that a lot of shows had at the time i think it really did particularly well with uh realism yes because nothing yes. really happened i mean some stuff was far-fetched sure it's a cartoon for kids mm-hmm. so some uh scenarios might not have actually happened but they kept everything within the realm of like possibility for human beings yes. for you know nothing happened that would be there were no talking animals like yeah. animals didn't talk in this universe right. which is super cool for me in fiction I prefer it to be just off the beaten path of reality. Right. Like the realism is what's impressive to me. Mm-hmm. It's more impressive to me if you can take something real and fictionalize it and make it believable than it is to create a whole entire like fantasy world. I agree. I was never really a fantasy. I mean, there are things that I like, but for the most part, I wasn't a fantasy person. I really like the slice of life type of mm-hmm. fiction. And I mean, I, I like fantasy, but I prefer fantasy that's set in reality. Yeah. I like that sort of- Like Harry Potter. Like Harry Potter, yes. You have yeah. the real and world- and me too. That's really where I draw my line. Side. It's like they they incorporate elements of fantasy, but it has this real yes. uh, foundation. Yes. And that's kind of what Hey Arnold does. I mean, like you said, there's mm-hmm. a lot of the darker, realistic parts of life, but also these eerie, like urban legend- Yeah. Fringes of society kind of things that they do, like the pigeon man. Yes. You remember, I was really, uh, I was thinking like, well- <laughs> Certain things probably would never happen thinking of Pigeon Man, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but even that could happen. Like feasibly in reality, it could happen. It could. Possibly. Uh, Weez and Ed. Do you remember that one, that episode? Weez and Ed? Yeah. It was another urban legend episode. Creepy. Suffice to say, there are plenty, plenty of episodes that we could cover. And we will. And hopefully we will. And hopefully about it. Yeah. So that that realism is what's impressive to me. We were, I, for sure. I was just talking with our friend Luke about like poetry. And he asked me like, because he's reading a lot of poetry, he asked me for recommendations of poets that I like. And I was like, I like Bukowski. Like I just like, yeah. I like realism. I yeah. like real poetry. I like when you make the real things romantic and interesting. And that's what I go for. And so it really is no surprise that Hey Arnold has always been my, like, close to my heart. And so many of the characters are adults. Yes. That is another. Maybe even equal parts. Almost, yes. Almost equal parts. Like, we have these, on the one hand, we have these latchkey kids. And then on the other hand, we have these adults kind of, like, muddling through their life, too. And they do a really good job of kind of portraying the uncertainty of life and how nobody has it figured out. Right. And I, I really like that. It's beautiful. Honestly, it's just really well done. It's beautiful. It gives you a weird sense of peace. Yes. And it always has. You trust them and you, you think, well, if they can figure out it, like figure it out day to day, 
I can too. Yep. I can do this. Man. I think that's why I liked Hey Arnold because also he was just a cool guy. Like he wasn't yeah. like, oh, he's the he coolest. wasn't a cool guy. <laughs> he was a super nerd. Yeah. But he had his group of friends and he was always loyal and he took care of his people. He did. You know? Yes. He looked out for them. They looked out for him. You're you're just hitting on so many things that I'm excited to talk about because they talked about a lot of this in the interviews that I read. Nice, as well. nice. But before we get to all that, I'll give you like a breakdown of Hell yeah. the show, like a background on the show. I'm so excited because like anything else we've done, I don't know anything about how the show was made. Nothing. Yeah, I only, I knew very little before I kind of dug into yes. that. And I feel like I've pulled from a lot of corners of the internet to get this together. So if, if you're not familiar with the show, this will give you a great background. Or if you kind of remember it from, you know, vaguely from your childhood, you didn't watch it, you know, heavily. This will get you there, I nice. promise. <laughs> Let's kick off 2022. Here we go with 2022 and Hey Arnold. Uh, the show aired on Nickelodeon from October 7th, 1996 Whoa. to June 8th, 2004. Wow. And that places it squarely in some of like our most impressionable years, I feel like. Well, yeah. Much like Are yeah. You Afraid of the Dark. It was right in that sweet spot of kind of growing up, gr- figuring out what we liked, what we, you know, having opinions on anything. Mm-hmm. It was all kind of in that same time period. It's perfect, yeah. And I did not know this, but production for Hey Arnold actually wrapped in December of 2001. No way. And the last season, the episodes of the last season were released over four years from 2001 to 2004. Well, from 2000 to 2004. Is it just because they got it done and they had them? Or was there a reason for that? Do you know? It. I think that there were a lot of... So Craig Bartlett had some disagreements with contracts with Nickelodeon because they wanted to retain him as like a exclusive animator mm-hmm. and he wanted to, to animate for other studios. And so it ended with him leaving Nickelodeon in like 2001 or 2002. So interesting. there was a lot of um, conflict right at the end. More of that business side of the creative pursuit that we talk about sometimes. This That hairy, yeah. awful, like you have to have all this business talk. Just to create. And it played in more than more than I knew. Yeah, yeah. It's terrible. It played into the whole show. But we'll I'll walk you through that story. Mm-hmm. But for those of you who are unfamiliar or if you need a refresher, the show centers around Arnold Shortman. And it's kind of a funny joke. Throughout the entire series, they don't say his surname. They just it, it's Schwartzman? like scratched out where you can't read it. Shortman. 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 Like short Arnold man? Shortman. Correct. <laughs> I didn't know his they last don't, name. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't really, they don't technically reveal it in the series. It's like always like obscured in some way. It's always blurred out or they like cut before they say it. But throughout the series, his grandpa calls him short man. That's like his nickname. Oh, yes. Okay. So I knew that. All right. Yeah. Man, this all coming back. It's because of his last name. But they revealed it in Hey Arnold, the movie. That's when they like officially said that short man is his last name. I never saw that. So we'll have to watch it at some point. Oh, man. Oh, dude. Did you see it? Yeah, yeah, I did see it. I haven't seen it in years, but I saw it at the time. What I haven't seen, and I know I'm doing this episode before having seen it, and that's probably a crime, but I actually haven't seen the Jungle movie that came out in 2017. I haven't either. I haven't seen that one. That's all right. Yeah. I haven't seen any of the new Are You Afraid of the Dark stuff. Oh, really? Really? Oh, I've seen that. Man, there's just so much like the nostalgia. Everybody's everybody's after the nostalgia right now. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Arnold Shortman, he's a fourth grader. Too young. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a fourth grader. He's nine years old. And he lives with his grandparents in the Sunset Arms boarding house that his grandparents run. Mm-hmm. I think that that age range is unrepresented in media as a whole pretty widely. I feel like chapter books, like kids' chapter books, focus on that age group because that's what you know, they cater to that age group because that's the age yeah. the kids are as they're reading it. Is that like middle grade or whatever? Well, it's before, yes, but it's, you're not in junior high yet. Yeah. The hormones haven't kicked in. So you're kind of figuring out who you are before it's kind of ripped away from you again in middle and high school, yeah. I feel like. They're so mature for nine-year-olds. Oh, I know. <laughs> but I was this mature at nine years old. I was watching, well. I wasn't. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I was watching this at nine years old. So it really resonated with me and I felt like they weren't talking down to me, which is a lot of the things that we like and appreciate they weren't yeah. talking down to us and of course it's a four five se- five year run so they do change and grow up a little bit throughout the series but he's a fourth grader when it begins and he stays nine years old in the fourth grade the whole time he mostly does yeah i think that there may be episodes where he moves up but for the most part he stays in that middle range he doesn't go to high school man you know he's a very uh eventful he sure does <laughs> Nine, ninth year and tenth year of his life yes he does a lot happens <laughs> it definitely uh 
it, it, it's the latchkey kid. Mm -hmm. It's what we've been talking about. He has this whole life that is so divorced from the life of his family. Um, he's raised by his grandparents, like I mentioned. He's in this boarding house. Like you mentioned earlier, there's all these adults in the universe. Yeah. He is really the most mature character <laughs> of them all. Oh, and yeah. I feel like I've felt that way in my life sometimes. I I've, I've felt like I was kind of keeping things together, like oldest daughter vibes. That's just kind of- I felt that way in high school. Yeah. Oh, I definitely did. I matured sure. way too quickly, like intellectually, I guess, and emotionally, and was just like bored with all the high school stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't like 16-year-olds when I was 16, you know? Oh, I was no, just me like, neither. you guys are dumb. Yep. I hated teenagers when I was one. And now that I'm 30, <laughs> I'm like, man, I should be way more of an adult than I am. <laughs> I don't That's know, the I thing. Stopped. It's like arrested development. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I peaked we, at some point right. in my maturity. I, same. I was, I don't know, I was probably like 24 and I just I think stopped. I was like 23. Yeah, 22, 23. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so yeah, they live, Arnold and his friends and family, live in a fictional city called Hillwood. Hillwood. You mentioned New York earlier. Well. Wow. To children like us who grew up in the American South, it very much does resemble New York City. But Craig Bartlett said that it was actually an amalgamation of northern cities that he has spent time in, lived in, including Seattle, which is where he's from, Portland, where he went to art school, and Brooklyn, where he lived for a while as well. Gotcha. So he kind of wove all of these places that he loved into That's cool. the city. But again, for me, you know, the, the fact that Arnold goes to PS 118, you know, that's what I've seen from some place like New York. It's very big. There's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a very urban place. Yeah. I bet different kids thought of different cities, too. Exactly. Yeah. I bet if you grew up in Seattle and you watched it, you were like, this is home. Probably, probably. Seattle. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. For me, like the only big city I knew about as a kid living in the in the American South was just New York. Mm -hmm. There was no other big city. It was New York City. Yeah. That that's true. That's the only one I could visualize because, I mean, all the movies happened there. And also because we went there as a family when I was like 10. Yeah. I went when I was 12. So I probably only thought that. Because I went there. Right. The only that, big that city I've ever been That was your frame of to. reference. Yeah. But it makes sense. I mean, it, it's in there. You know, it's all in there. The subway, all the brownstones. Like, yeah. It's, it's like Gotham. <laughs> it's like Gotham. So while we're here, since Craig wove all this stuff into the show, do you want a little breakdown on the creator of Hey Arnold? Oh, I want to break down so hard. Okay, good. I'm ready to break down <laughs> for you. So <laughs> guys, we're a little rusty. <laughs> we're a little rusty on this whole podcast thing. So if you could just uh Yeah, we're basically starting break. over. What are we doing here? It feels like we're starting over. Oh god. Break it down. Break it down. So, and then build it back up for me because that's how we have to. That's how we have to do it. That's psychologically very healthy. I just heard such a weird sound in my house. It's a ghost You're coming back. I hope that was a cat. It might have been a ghosty. I thought, I hope it was a cat. I don't know. No, it's a ghost. So Craig Bartlett is the creator of Hey Arnold. Uh, he grew up in Seattle, like I mentioned, and then he studied communications at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Nice. And then he graduated and he learned the art of stop motion animation mm -hmm. at Will Vinton Studios in Portland, Oregon. Okay. So he was doing a lot of artsy communication-y kind of stuff stuff in his education that was big at that time stop motion oh was stop huge. motion was huge and it plays a role in the creation of the show Ooh, all right uh i learned from imdb that he created several shorts featuring arnold mm -hmm. who was originally a friend to a character that a claymation character that he created as an element on peewee's playhouse i <laughs> going back to the 80s yeah i read about that when i was yes. like uh making a list of episodes for this. Oh, nice. And I, I came across this like early, early 80s claymation something. And I was like, I have to watch that. Yes. And I haven't it yet because I forgot about it. It was one of his first like animation gigs and it was claymation for Pee Wee's Playhouse. That's so So wild. he created this character of Penny. <laughs> Penny. And because he had this, this character Penny, he created Arnold as a friend for Penny. And then there were several shorts like claymation. I believe they're claymation animated shorts that center around Arnold. That's so funny. So these shorts were <laughs> Arnold escapes from church. <laughs> yes. Yes. This was in 1988. <laughs> Sounds like us. <laughs> it, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. The Arnold waltz in 1990 and Arnold rides his chair in 1991. Rides his chair. Rides his chair. That's the name of the short. Questionable. I have not seen it, so I cannot speak to it. It is short a question man mark. Riding his chair, escaping <laughs> from church. <laughs> exactly. Deconstructing before it was cool. <laughs> Seriously. Man, 1988. And I did not know this, but a lot of people may know this from just the years of animation and internet. But no one knows this. Arnold comic strips appeared in the Simpsons Illustrated magazine. 
by Matt Groening, who was the creator of The Simpsons. Yeah. And he was also Craig Bartlett's brother-in-law. No way. Way. Yeah. They, no his way. brother-in-law I created The Simpsons. I don't believe you. <laughs> I, is, yeah, I was, my mind was blown. I had no idea. That's wild. But this is common knowledge on the internet, so sorry, Reddit. We're moving slow. <sighs> But yeah, they were related. And a quick aside, if that blows your mind, some people may know this as well, but Arnold's grandpa, Phil, Mm -hmm. he was voiced by Dan Castellaneta, who is obviously insanely prolific voice actor, but the original voice of Homer Simpson. There you go. So more, you know, all these crossovers. I love how all these old shows cross over everything. So many crossovers. Animation in the 80s and 90s. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody was working with everybody. It had to be a pretty same. small world, though. I I would imagine mm-hmm. it was such a new thing. I mean, it wasn't OK. It wasn't new. And to gain that but, skill set, you know, you're, there are only a handful of places that you're learning it. Yeah. So. And the people who knew how to do it, there had to be a very finite number of them. Like, yeah. And it feels like they were just all either friends or related (laughs) (laughs) or just yeah related that's awesome that's that's so cool so craig after this gig with Wee's playhouse he worked as a story animator on rugrats okay and this is where he made his nickelodeon connections and he joined this group of writers that were working on nickelodeon shows in 1993 lucky bastard (laughs) i know right so when did rugrats come out what's this timeline here rugrats was 91 like early 90s okay yeah I think Rugrats started in 91. That was one of the first. It was one of the shows. original Nicktoons. Right. Yeah. So he got in really we, early. We, we got to do a big like Nickelodeon history episode. I know. We have to. Yeah, we should. We really, we keep touching on and it. And there's a book that I found that we can That's exciting. Uh, get and use as a reference. Can't wait. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> Looking anyways. forward to it. Continuing. Continuing. Our yeah, that sounds great. Um, 2022. Wow. 2022. Yeah. <laughs> So this writer's room that he joined, Mm -hmm. it was for several shows on Nickelodeon at the time. And apparently tensions are high in this writer's room. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of competing voices. There are a lot of competing executives with different opinions. Sounds about right. And Craig finds himself in a pitch meeting that doesn't go very well on the whole. And as he's having trouble, somebody says, well, play play the penny tapes. So the the character that he developed for Pee-wee's Playhouse. So he goes to play the penny tapes, but on the tape, before the penny tapes, were the Arnold shorts. Okay. So an executive at Nickelodeon sees these Arnold shorts and really likes the character of Arnold. And they're like, well, why don't we, why are we not doing this? We should do this. Like, let's make a a story, a show about this character. Hmm. So that fateful meeting (laughs) is what led to the creation of... The show, Hey Arnold. I got to see these shorts because now I'm like, I know. was he football headed? What made him so enticing as a stop motion claymation little character? I know. Yeah. Like, what what was what it about, about Arnold? It was so exactly. good to these so uh, Craig, executives. Craig said, I'm going to quote him. Yeah. We did a lot of talking about who Arnold is. We came up with a reluctant hero who keeps finding himself responsible for solving something, making the right choices, and doing the right thing. Boy, wasn't he made responsible for everything. He really was. <laughs> it just was all on his shoulders, and maybe that's why I related to him. Yeah, I was. I always wanted to be Arnold. Me, oh, me, I wanted to be. I was in love with him. I loved him. I had I such a crush I guess on I him. could relate to him, but I was like, man, you're way cooler than I am. I'll never oh, be he, you. He is so cool. So cool. So cool. Of the supporting characters in the show, Craig said that a lot of the characters are an amalgamation of people that he knew when he was a kid. Mm. He said, and I love this, he said, the girls in Hey Arnold are girls that either liked or didn't like me when I was in school. Nice. <laughs> and I just, you can feel this in the show, right? Like, yeah. you can feel his experience just coming through so, it's so pure in a way. Yeah. And I love it. Oh, it just captures that time in life. It really does. It has an almost like a Wonder Years quality to it, where it really just mm-hmm. hones in on what it feels like to be that age. Yeah. And it it's just spot on. I it's love it. It's very coming of age in, in a way. Yes. Coming of Even age. Even if he doesn't really grow up. He doesn't, but we did. And that's but what's we, cool. <laughs> but we did. And that's what matters. Yeah. I like that a lot, too, because I like the idea that we're really seeing this world through Arnold's eyes mm-hmm. and how he experiences it. Yes. So if each character is sort of made up as how they interact with Arnold Mm -hmm. and who they are to Arnold, they're going to be a true, well, what becomes in his mind a stereotype of that person. Yep. They're going to be true to that character every time because that's how they interact with Arnold. Yes. And when he is surprised with a character who does something different than they would have done before because they 
grew up or learned a lesson or there was a moral to whatever the story is. Mm -hmm. When he experiences that, you feel it too. Yeah, for sure. And the shifts in worldview, the way that he, because there are a lot of references to like historical events. Yeah, yeah. American history. Um, there are a lot of references to things like that in this show, and you feel him learning it, mm-hmm. and it it show, it tells you something about other people. The um, empathy yes, in this the show empathy. is very strong, especially when he does something wrong and he's ashamed of it. Yeah, you you felt that weight. Mm-hmm. You felt heavy with him in a way, which is beautiful. Yeah, it all goes back to the realism, mm-hmm. the way that the dialogue, even though it was a little bit larger than life with some of the characters, it felt real. It felt honest. Yes. And it's so good. Yes, very accessible. Very accessible. Accessible. That's a good word for it. Um, Yeah, buddy. So Craig began writing the pilot of Hey Arnold in 1994. And this 10-minute pilot episode, it was just called Arnold. Hmm. And it was shown in theaters beginning on July 10th, 1996, before Nickelodeon's first feature-length film. Do you know what that film was? I remember this vividly. I had the orange tape. Rugrats in Paris? Nope, it was not animated. Oh, so Nickelodeon's first feature first length, feature length f- film. film. Was that it went based to on theaters. a show that was live action? Mm mm. Oh, then no. Nope. I-, I won't. Starring know. Michelle Trachtenberg? I don't. Is that no. Rosie O'Donnell? Nothing. With Rosie O'Donnell? Yeah. I know the movie, but I don't I don't know. I know <laughs> in my mind now I'm going, okay, Rosie O'Donnell, sure. But I don't remember. What it is specifically. Harriet the Spy. Harriet the Spy. There it is. I yes. was Harriet the Spy. I of was course like you were. <laughs> <laughs> I can't express to you how much I embodied Harriet the Spy. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> she was me, I was she. This was a whole thing in my mind. So I do think <laughs> it's pretty cool that the first time the world saw the character of Arnold. It was in conjunction with this film. Yeah. The orange VHS tape. Oh my god. With, like Oof. There were several, but Harriet Spy was the first. That was the most like cutting edge thing you could do in that time was to have a colored VHS tape Honestly. that wasn't and black. So that pilot never actually went to television. That only ever aired in theaters, and they reimagined and re redrew the pilot for Nickelodeon. Hmm. Interesting. So another one of those like one off, this is only certain people's eyes have seen it kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to Craig really quick to wrap him up. <laughs> yeah. Not that you can wrap up a person, but... You can. I've been wrapped up before. <laughs> um, in in The Nicest Bow I Can, Craig has created a couple of other kids shows for PBS since the Hey Arnold heyday, including Dinosaur Train in 2009. I was about to graduate high school at this point, so I, I never saw Dinosaur Train. Me neither. And he also did a show called Ready, Jet, Go in 2016. <laughs> Okay. So he's still doing kids shows and I, I'm interested to see what those are like and if they have the same spirit of, you know, Hey Arnold. Yeah. Uh, hey Arnold was made by Craig Bartlett's own production company and you're going to know and remember everybody listening, you're going to remember the screen. Class Gay Chupo. <laughs> it, yeah, exa- it's kind of like that. It's Snee- <gasps> Sneoosh. Sneosh. Yes. Oh you remember seeing God. that? So yes, that's Craig course. Bartlett's production company. Oh my Lord. He founded it in 1986 and I've wondered this all my life and never taken the time to Google it. But Sneosh, Sneosh was named for an area of Washington inhabited by the First Nation tribe. Wow. So it was near where he grew up and he liked it. So it'd be like if we had a uh, production company called Ma Villa. Yeah, it would. Yeah. How dope mm-hmm. would that be? Exactly. Really kind of cool. like be almost appropriation. Probably wouldn't fly today, but. <laughs> it probably wouldn't. It's a little uncool. And I mean, even the screen, like the the logo, you remember, was like a totem pole. Yes. So yeah, probably a little bit of appropriation. But it was near to where he grew up. It was something that he related to his life. And yeah, that's kind of cool. Anyway, <laughs> so Hey Arnold as a series culminated in a TV movie originally titled Arnold Saves the Neighborhood, but Nickelodeon released it theatrically as Hey Arnold the Movie in June 2002 which I didn't see it in theaters, but I saw it at some point. I don't know when. It probably was on tape. I gotta watch it. And the disputes about his contract happened right after this. And there was a second movie in the works. And at that point, that's when Craig ended up leaving Nickelodeon. And this movie was released in 2017 as Hey Arnold, the Jungle Movie. So here's a really fun fact for you. Are you ready for this one? Yes. This was on a lot of interviews, places where I I read about Hey Arnold. This is kind of a central fact to the making of Hey Arnold because it wouldn't have been this way without this fact. 
It was Nickelodeon's first animated series to feature kids voiced by actual children instead of adults. Really? The first one. Aside from the character of Brainy, who was voiced by Craig Bartlett himself. No way. (laughs) He also voiced Abner the Pig. (laughs) That's amazing. So good. And I mean, I love that in a creator to like keep yourself kind of tied into the show so doing cool. these smaller roles. I think that's incredible. Yeah. I aspire to that. So cool. Little vocal cameos. But as a result of being voiced by actual children, mm-hmm. many of the male characters on the show were recast at least once, some several times throughout the show's run Yeah, due to the child actors reaching puberty and their voices changing. That's fine. One of the only there, I think there were two male characters that remained the same throughout the series. One was Jamil Walker Smith, Jamil Smith, the voice of Gerald. Mm -hmm. And when his voice changed, they held auditions for a new actor, but they just couldn't find another Gerald. It just didn't feel like Gerald. And so they wrote it into the universe that his voice changed with the episode of Gerald's tonsils. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) So I, I love it. Uh, the other male character that didn't that wasn't recast was Harold. His voice was already changing when they began the show, mm-hmm. and so it just kind of carried through as the same the whole time. But I thought that was pretty cool for Gerald. So wait, Arnold, his voice actor changed. His voice changed, and he was recast like five times. I'm gonna tell you all about it. <laughs> wow. We'll get there. We'll get there. But I didn't yeah, know that. Yes. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, Hey Arnold had its fair share of creepy episodes. Uh, like we talked about the season two Halloween episode, the reimagining of the War of the Worlds fiasco, yeah. which is basically an urban legend now. Yeah, uh, pretty much. The H.G. Bell's novel that was adapted into the radio play. And I've read more about this in the last year. I don't know why. I looked it up for some reason, but apparently far fewer people actually panicked <laughs> than we think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a bummer because <laughs> it is kind of urban legend status now. Yeah. The Hey Arnold team had an affinity, clearly, for the unsettling and unimaginable and kind of setting that down in the midst of the mundane life of the latchkey kid. I like it. There were episodes of Hey Arnold all about love potions. Do you remember that? When Helga, (laughs) I God, it was so good. It was fantastical, but it was so grounded in reality. Yeah. Uh, Like I mentioned, historical references um, with Mr. Wynn, the boarding house Mm -hmm. and his uh, boarding house resident and his daughter. Uh, there were references to like World War Two. I think that yeah. Grandpa would have been in World War II. Um, There was an episode where Phoebe, who was a classmate of Arnold's and Helga's best friend, she won like a sweepstakes to meet the pop star idol of the time that she loved. <laughs> do you remember that one? I loved that I episode. Yeah, it was so. It was like a. It was like uh, Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, but yeah. a Hey Arnold episode. It was essentially the same plot line, but it was really good. Yeah. And I was always very much drawn to the Helga Mm storyline with her shrine and her epic (laughs) poems of unrequited love. Super creepy shrine made of bubblegum. It was like, it was, but it was such a vibe. Like, that's how it felt. Even if that isn't how we all acted, I certainly never had a shrine toward anybody. (laughs) But it feels, the gravity of a crush at that age, it feels that way. No, yeah, I get it. I get it. And I I love that they were able to kind of capture the- major crushes yeah they captured the magnitude of a crush oh the way it I felt love. to be a kid do you remember love, yeah do you remember the episode where arnold takes lila to the cheese festival carnival <laughs> yes oh my gosh i think about that episode all the time oh truly Lord. there's nothing more romantic in my mind even though it didn't go super great for arnold in the episode <laughs> right. it was so romantic to me the thought of it at the time they really they did capitalize on what it was like to be a kid at that time. I and mean, that just that's just the nature of Nickelodeon. That's the spirit, exactly. right? The essence. The essence um, of Nickelodeon. They were but true to it. They were like, it. okay, what would kids be learning about in school? What would kids Maybe be World learning? They'd be learning about these wars. They'd be learning about these uh, points in history. Mm-hmm. They'd be experiencing these feelings and having their first these feelings, crush. These urban legends told around the playground. Yep. Like Friday the 13th with like, 100%. you know, you can't step on the sidewalk cracks or like oh, walk yeah. under ladders. Or walk I mean, under ladders. We discuss yeah. that stuff at length at school, Same. especially even using your imagination to get into all these scary stories or these urban legends or the fantastical side of this world, this universe. Yeah. You always wanted that to happen to you as a kid. It's kind of the part of your life that you're closest to that. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Because you haven't really learned that it isn't real. Mm-hmm. You have, but you haven't accepted it yet. It's peak imagination. It's peak imagination. That's totally it. And I think that's why it's so enduring. It's that weird threshold in life where you God, you're still so- a kid but you're you're on the cusp of growing up yeah. way faster than you want to 
Yes. And you don't really know what to do with and all you don't these know what feelings, to do or emotions. what's happening. Yes. Mm-hmm. This is my love letter to you, Hey Arnold. This mm. is this show did so much for me. So this yeah. episode truly we're going to keep coming back to this feeling because it was just so visceral so and so important in my life. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned, as I said, <laughs> as I mentioned, Helga, you said that it was creepy. Well, I mean, yeah. So <laughs> Francesca Marie Smith was the voice of Helga Pataki. And in an interview, I'm going to read a quote from her. It's got, it's, uh, it just made me, it warmed my heart. It made me happy because <laughs> they were thinking about all these things that I think about now as an adult watching the show or, you know, hearing about the show. Yeah. Uh, Francesca said, 20 years later, I look back and I think, okay, well, how do we navigate that boundary between a sort of funny obsession and something that can be really scary and problematic and really <laughs> deeply neurotic? And I don't know. In some way, I think how funny it was and the fact that it was a cartoon allowed us to push it into a territory that in real life would be really scary. Yeah. But at the same time, it was really powerful. It was a really powerful physical representation of all the feelings that she didn't know what to do with. Nice. I would be careful to say, yeah, of course, we don't want to encourage obsessive behavior. But beyond that, it does strike me as a very poignant and honest reflection of how deep and incredibly powerful and, yeah, a little weird those (laughs) feelings can be. That's awesome. Like she, she, under, I mean, obviously she understood it. She portrayed the character, but this, most of the quotes that I will pull are from an Uproxx interview that was like the oral history of Hey yeah. Arnold, basically. Yeah. There were several interviews that came out around the time that the Jungle movie came out. And I think this was one of them, but it was incredible. Such a good read. That's awesome. Um, That's cool. And while we're here talking about Francesca, she had an extensive career through the 90s and early 2000s. Some other notable roles that she played include Emily in the Beethoven TV series. Oh, my god! That was animated. Um, Upside Down Girl on Recess. Okay. (laughs) Remember the Upside Down Girl? (laughs) Yeah. This was Francesca. (laughs) And she also featured on live action shows like Alex Mack, Two of a Kind, oh, Mary Kate and Ashley, and The Amanda Show. Wow. So she was all over my childhood. I gotta look honestly. her up and see, see if I recognize yeah, her. Yeah, see if you recognize her. And speaking of recognizing people, I'll also do a little breakdown on the character of Arnold and the many voices of Arnold himself. Wow. Uh, as I mentioned, he was voiced by several guys due to voice changes in the age range of the actor. But season one, <laughs> we have my favorite Arnold. Lane Torin, also known as Torin Caudell. So if you have never seen the voice of the original season one, Arnold, everyone must right now go to the Instagram. <laughs> Isn't he like super handsome or something? He is a beautiful man. <laughs> um, yeah, Lane Torin is on Instagram. He's like an influencer now. Of course. And as he should be. He capitalize on that. His face, it's just top notch. Do it. But Lane, at, when he was a kid in this time got period. Got a good face, man. <laughs> He, he also voiced characters on Ah, Real Monsters, yes. Recess, As Told by Ginger, and another show that was one of my absolute favorite cartoons. It was really Hey Arnold, hey Arnold and The Weekenders. Did you ever watch The Weekenders? That sounds really familiar. God, I don't think it was a, it was like Disney, it was like an offshoot of Disney or, I don't know. I don't know what network, I should have looked it up, but Hey Arnold and The Weekenders are my top two favorite cartoons of all time. Nice. And I thought it was really cool that he was featured on that as well. Yeah. Another fun fact about Lane Torin is that he also voiced Wolfgang. Wow. Who was the fifth grader that was the bully on Hey Arnold. So once he kind of graduated from the role of Arnold, he came back as the fifth grade bully. That's awesome. And I think this happened with a couple of other of the Arnolds to the point where they're like, this is a life cycle. Like, <laughs> once <laughs> you've been Arnold, then you become Arnold's bully mm, kind of thing. That's funny. Which is really cool. Wow. I guess they would have very similar voices. So. Right. And Sure, that makes sense. So Lane also returned to use his voice for background characters in the 2017 movie. And I think that's mm. so cool, too, just to kind of play that full circle. That is cool. Live action-wise, Lane Torin played... A surfer in the Mary Kate and Ashley uh, classic <laughs> Billboard Dad. <laughs> I loved Billboard Dad. You're just grinning um, ear to ear. You're like, mm, it was short lived. Played a surfer. Yeah, he played a surfer, but I mean, he was a kid at the time. So was I. He's, a, he, I guess, he's a little <laughs> older than me. Yeah. He also played the character Rod on Seventh Heaven. Okay. Yeah, Lane Torrin, incredible. Clearly, yeah, he's he's awesome. Wow, you're in love. In season two and three. Arnold was voiced by Philip Van Dyke. Philip Van Dyke played Luke in the Halloween Town movies. No way. Yes. Wow. And to paint another picture for you, all of my Gilmore Girls people out there, I haven't had a chance to mention Gilmore Girls yet on the show, but it's one of my favorite shows of all time. I'll get it in there. You know I will. Um, (laughs) Philip Van Dyke also played 
a young Christopher Hayden in one of the Gilmore Girls episodes. And if you've seen the show, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. There's an episode where they flash back to Lorelai and Christopher and when she they her their parents find out that she's pregnant and yada yada. But I'm painting a picture. You'll see his face if you know that episode. Yeah. He was a voice of Arnold. In season four and most of season five, Arnold was voiced by Spencer Klein. And I couldn't find many more credits for him. But there were also a handful of other actors that voiced Arnold in season five and beyond, like, movies, including Alex D. Lenz, who was Max Keeble in the movie Max Keeble's Big Move. <laughs> okay. So there were lots of actors for this one yeah, character. Wow. It's pretty I never, wild. never would have guessed that. I knew the yeah. handsome guy played Arnold because I saw some like BuzzFeed article right. or something yeah. one time. And I was like, oh, that's the guy who voiced Arnold. Cool. I didn't know yes. there were like four but other guys. He was guys. just the season, season one Arnold. That's dope. Yeah. So he was part of this interview that they did. Lane Torn was. Yeah. And he said, I can't speak for later seasons, but in season one, Arnold was pretty oblivious to Helga's obsession with him. Maybe on a subconscious level, he was into her. I could definitely see a Hey Arnold, the college years where they fall madly in love. <laughs> sure. Of course. But like, man, pull in like a Save by the Bell for Hey Arnold and just seeing all these characters or, or like a Rugrats like all a, grown yeah, up. Yeah, all something. grown up. Yeah. Which I hated Gosh. that show, but... Yeah, I wasn't Whatever. the biggest fan, but I watched it. I mean, I just don't think it was done well. Yes, I think it could have been done better. And it could have if, been way if better. the creators of Hey Arnold came back together to do an animated yeah. Arnold All Grown Up, I would watch the hell out of that. I'd watch it. So I say good. that as somebody who hasn't seen the you know movies, but <laughs> right? Yeah, I guess we didn't really put our money where our mouth was in that in that aspect. But sue me. So to get a full appreciation for this episode of Hey Arnold, I feel like we should first talk a little bit about the Headless Horseman. It's just you won't be able to appreciate it fully if we don't. Let's so do it. I'm going to give you guys some some background. Earlier I was like, well, you know, one day maybe we'll cover the uh, adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Oh, Toad. Oh, dude, I think we probably will. I mean, we could. So I don't want to give away too much Yikes. now about Yikes. the Headless Horseman, Yikes. but enough okay. for context of this episode okay. for sure. Hmm. You know, I want to rain in your parade here. Yeah. I, I want to hmm. dampen okay. your biscuit. I won't go but. too <laughs> too in-depth of the plot of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Okay. Because there's a lot there, too. Yes. It's set in New York. It's an area rife with ghosts and supernatural power. And the infamous, quote-unquote, commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air is the Headless Horseman. Oof. I won't even... I was going to talk about the background, but you're right. We could go into the Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. <laughs> all right. But... It's a revolution era story from 1776, mm -hmm. and I, I think I read the Washington Irving Irving story. Mm -hmm. I think I read it in school, yeah. but that didn't really stick in my. Even though the quotes that I've read from it recently are so beautiful, and I'm like, this sounds, this is so great. Why didn't I, didn't it stick? Mm -hmm. But I was really young, I guess, when I read it. Yeah, like you made me watch Johnny Depp's Sleepy Hollow. I did for Halloween last year, or not even last year, 2020. A year and some change, right? A year and some change. But the Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad was a 1949 Disney cartoon, and that is where I have my story of. Got Gotcha. Sleepy Hollow gotcha. from like that's the that's the one that stayed <laughs> yeah. for, for whatever reason. It's I guess I was a kid. It's way more accurate to the original narrative than, than the Tim Burton. Yes, it is. Sleepy Hollow. It is. They're both great. They're both, They're both fantastic. Great, but yes, the adventure of Ichabod and Mr. Toad definitely stuck. It plays up more of who Ichabod Crane actually was. Which I love. Yeah. So I've always had a soft spot for that. It's a beautiful we'll story. Leave, we'll leave some of those. We'll leave that for another episode, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. But I will tell you. That there is a good deal of additional folklore surrounding the Sleepy Hollow tale. Yes. And has been since the Middle Ages. This type of story of a headless entity. Um, you mentioned Sir Gowan and the Green Knight in the yes. Green Ribbon episodes. That is at length a headless entity. Mm -hmm. I also read about an Irish legend. Yeah, you did. Do you know about the, the Delahan? I do. You do. You would. Mm hmm or, or dark man, as he's called. Mm -hmm. I would like to give a description of this creature, which it seems that some elements of the Headless Horseman were based on this, yes. probably, because this was around long before the Headless Horseman. There, I, yeah, it all, one of the only true examples of trickle-down anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Um, this is not a politics podcast. No, but <laughs> it feels it like it sometimes, though, doesn't it? All of these old, old uh, stories and legends and lores that mostly all, I mean, a lot of like this in particular 
comes from very old world pagan mythology. Yes. Um, old, old stories. Yes. Pre-Christian sometimes. Oh, yeah. Not, maybe, not, maybe not pre-Christian, but uh, before. In that same era. From lands that were not Christianized quite yet. Mm. Yes. Mm. You mean colonized? Hey, oh, um, oh, 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 shots fired. Musket <laughs> shots fired. Oh, I have lots of feelings about that, but. Blunderbust. Would you like to hear about the the Dillahan, or yes, I'm sorry. would you, on behalf <laughs> yes. of the listener, like to hear about it since you already know? Everything? Oh God, yes! Please tell us about the Dillahan. I'm ready. Okay, so it carries its head under its arm. Sure does. The mouth is usually in a hideous grin that touches both sides of the head. Mm. Its eyes are constantly moving and can see across the countryside even during the darkest nights. Terrifying. <laughs> The Dillahan is believed to use the spine of a human corpse for a whip. My back the, hurts. <laughs> that Suddenly. means your back hurt. Yeah, it's Yeah, I'm going to stretch unpleasant. and pop it. Oh, human corpse yes. for a whip. Whoops. Its black carriage, the cochabor, meaning death coach, is adorned with what they called in this article yeah. funeral objects. It has candles in skulls to light the way. Mm -hmm. The spokes of the wheels are made from thigh bones, and the wagon's covering is made from worm-chewed, dried human skin. Oh, God. Chewed? Chewed. Worm-chewed, yes. Oh, my God. Yes. This is what I live <laughs> I for. Know, I know you do. I, I, oh. I was kind of bummed that you knew all about it, because I wasn't going to get to, to say those I, things to you. I know you. <laughs> about it. I know that it exists. I wouldn't have been able to give you those okay. descriptors. Well, here we are. My, my library of almost knowledge I have. Yes, you do have an extensive library of almost knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, wow, that's beautiful. Yes. God, I love so that this, so much. This Ugh. Kochabor. Cue the organ music. Oh, yeah. Right? I can imagine the organ, organ music. But apparently seeing or hearing this coach is a harbinger of death. Mm -hmm. And the ancient Irish believed that when the Dolohan stopped riding, a person was due to die. Oh. That's amazing. So the Dullahan, Dullahan, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to our Irish listeners. Oh, the Dullahan. Dullahan there, thank you. Calls out the person's name, drawing away the soul of its victim, at which point the person immediately drops dead. Mm. So he stops his carriage and he says the name and they, they drop dead. I love it so much. I know you do. I do too. And I don't know why. I love all these like omens of death, the harbingers of death, anything. But we very much want to stay living. It's such a such a weird, oh, ironic, no, of course, complex way to be. It's the same thing as like the banshee yes, yes. of similar folklores of like. In a lot of similar folklore, banshees accompany the coach of war. Okay. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. There are banshees um, with the coach. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Because, you know, the, the banshee power. has, it's, you know, depending on who you ask, it has different, it does different things. Right. But really just hearing its cry is an omen of death. If you hear it, it yes. means you're going to die or someone that you, you love. And they, they say that die. of the coach as well. If you hear the wheels, if you hear mm -hmm. the coach approaching, you're- It's coming for doomed, you? Like doomed. Oh my yeah. God. That's beautiful. There are apparently rumors that golden objects can force the Dulahan to disappear. Golden objects? Golden okay. objects, yes. Do you have a note for that being I significant? Sure do. I okay, sure good, do. good, good, good. Because, um, <laughs> Did you? Is there anything to do with any kind of dogs or hounds there, with the Dullahan? There were overlapping things, but it was mm -hmm. mostly just the coach with the horse. They didn't. There weren't a lot gotcha, of dogs. Gotcha, gotcha. With the horse, legends that were and the same. sometimes accompanied by a banshee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. No, I trust me. We'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. No, okay. I know. I'm just. I'm trying to like make a note of all the yes, different uh, elements because yes, I made a note of everything in this in episode. episode. Yeah. That is referencing back to folklore. Yeah, well, we've made it here now. Okay, folks. wow. Oof, oof. All of this has led up to season four, episode 66 of Hey Arnold, which is the headless cabbie. In my opinion, the creepiest episode of Hey Arnold. In much of the internet's opinion, the creepiest episode of Hey Arnold. It's so well done. Apparently, in Christian's opinion, <laughs> the creepiest episode of Hey the Arnold. The creepiest. So, AKA the best. The episode opens with Arnold and the gang in his bedroom, which always so dope. I was so jealous of his bedroom. Yeah. He lives in kind of the penthouse of the sporting house. He has this, the skylight of his bedroom is all I have ever wanted. I still want it today. Mm -hmm. Oh, Need it. I own my own home, and I just don't have anything like that. It's really sad. But they're telling scary stories, as was expected at a sleepover in the 90s. What else would you do? It's like, are you afraid of the dark? It's their own little midnight society. Yes. It's us getting it's exactly together like to hang out. It's, you get together, and you tell the legend. Tell and me the stories. Lore, and it's so great. Man. So and as you mentioned at the top of this episode, uh, Stinky is talking at the beginning, Harold, Arnold's friend, 
<laughs> calling him Hey Arnold. Arnold's hey Arnold. That's what I do too. I call him Hey Arnold. <laughs> Why? His I name is Arnold. That. I've never done that before at, ever Arnold in Shortman. my life. But Stinky is telling a story of the monkey cat. It's a banana eating, milk drinking horror monster. Monkey cat. I love the way that he's talking because he just has these like. He's Southern, you know. I guess he's from Texas or something. I, I think they say it. Or Arkansas. He's from somewhere I just know south they put of him, this city. They Hillwood. put him outside the city in the country. I don't yes. know why he goes to Phoebe's school yelling. where they go I'm to school. I'm sorry, but. sweet girl. My little kitty's outside. Phoebe's. But uh, Stinky says, <laughs> Stinky says, I got me a fable that'll knock your socks off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he says. He Perfect. says, <laughs> Spot on. this here yarn of a horror. <laughs> it's so good. God, um, yes. It's so good. And yeah. God. But of course, we're hit again with decapitation, with Frankenstein elements. Yeah. It's become a much bigger theme on That's Pretty Dark than I could have ever imagined. But here we yeah. go. Yeah. Look, this is why we're talking about it. You guys thought I was an insane for talking about so much decapitation for two episodes. No. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. It's that everywhere. It was rampant. <laughs> Beheadings were rampant <laughs> in the 90s. Beheadings were rampant, but also just the idea of it has captivated fiction it really has. writers for a long time. I think that's what could really be worse? The, the idea. What could, what be, could worse? be worse? Nothing. Maybe a long... Well, anyway, <laughs> I can think of some things that would be worse from my recent imagination. I mean, I can think of worse things. But, but. Uh, so, sorry, Phoebe, you cannot come in here right now. She is so loud. Phoebe girl. Phoebe, uh, Kaylin's cat. My cat, not Phoebe. Not Helga's Not Helga's friend, friend, Phoebe. No, my cat's name is Phoebe. Adopted her in August of last year. Sweet baby. She's so <laughs> she's sweet. She's such a sweet baby, and she's so... Sorry if you hear her. You'll just have to... She'll just have to be part of this episode. That's fine. So, Arnold's story begins here, mm. and he describes a foggy night, of course, much like this one. Perfect. The night that they're all in. A hundred years ago, so this is, you know, a hundred years from... So, 1890... 1998 or something. 1896? Something like that. Arnold says that a cabbie was driving his carriage around the park when he was stopped by a mysterious woman... So good. ...in a red scarf who asked for a ride and helped to find her missing Scotty dog. A red scarf, but also a green cloak. She offers her scarf to the cabbie as they're riding, and she calls for her dog along the way... And she swears that she can hear her dog barking in the woods and insists that this cabbie drive faster and faster through the fog. So he's urging the horses on. This is a horse-drawn carriage if you haven't gotten that picture in your head or you don't recall. Mm -hmm. That sounds like my dog. My poor little baby. Follow him. Hurry. So her voice <laughs> has always haunted my mind. Yes. Always. Her voice is one of the reasons we're doing this podcast, I swear to you. Like, her voice is terrifying it is pure nightmare fuel it is like it is she seems innocent they're both this soft like faux british yeah early like kind of like it's mid like to an early affected American. transatlantic sort of accent yeah yeah faster 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 because he's like mum mm -hmm. yes mum uh-huh yeah, when her voice changes she, and it gets into that like pointed, very direct. She becomes maniacal. Oh, my doggies down the hill. Go down there. Hurry. Hurry. Um, she, but she she urges them on. They f they fly through a tunnel in the park, and they approach the gas lights on the other side of the tunnel. And a man jumps out at them with a huge golden hook for an arm. <laughs> says Arnold. Gold. And I'm like, huh? Um, I guess it's kind of scary in the moment. And. After I'd read The Legend of the Dullahan, I'm like, okay, yeah, a golden object in your path. Like, was he trying to stop? Did he think this was the, the Dullahan coming for him? Like, what's the, we don't know. Hey, who knows? Don't know. Did they just, I don't know why they inserted that, but they it's did. It's just a reference. I'm just thinking like, you're, you're talking through the elements of this urban legend. Yes. The story. Yes. So there's a lot thrown at it mm -hmm. that I feel like. A nine-year-old kid, if he'd heard the story from, like, he says, his grandfather, there would be elements thrown at it to make it That's sound true. as big and as scary as possible. Honestly, yeah. So You're so correct. he's like, you go through this tunnel, yeah. and there's a man with a hook for a hand. Yes. And, like, throwing all this stuff at it that actually, in reality, when it was being written as an episode, it's all referencing back to things sure. that seem random now, but there was significance to it it's all referencing back to folklore but the way that they told the story from the perspective of a nine-year-old yeah i love that you're so right it's all like random for the episode but it's how a nine-year-old tells a story yeah it is exactly but it's also intellectual yeah in how it was created it's so oh it's so good they do it all at the same time 
Man. So so they swerve the carriage to miss this man, and they go down the hill and off the, the beaten path. And this is when the woman's continuing to shout and scream about her missing Scotty dog and urging the cabbie to continue through the woods. And she's like, my doggy's down the hill. Go, hurry. Mm -hmm. And at this point, there's a frame that shows her face. And her hair has become all wild. And her teeth and nails have become sharp. Mm -hmm. And it is very dark. (laughs) Her her hair becomes very Bride of Mm Frankenstein-esque. Not with the streak or anything, but just very long and wild. Wild. Curly and big and long. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Hey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. But yeah, she grows uh, like vampire fangs. Yes. And you said she has cl- uh, claws. Mm-hmm. Her fingernails? I didn't see her fingernails. Are, they're just sharp. But Everything about her sharp. is sharp in that moment. That's somewhat Banshee esque. Yes. Somewhat werewolf slash Banshee. Yes. I made a connection to the Banshee that in my mind. I was like, she's screaming and she's yelling. Yes. My doggy, my little Scotty doggy. So yeah, those frames have always been in my memory as just so so scary they just did a good job in the simplicity you and i talk a lot about like not showing the monster yeah in the simplicity of it they show it but for such a short time that you almost aren't sure what you saw Mm -hmm. it's going by as quickly as he's telling the story yes yeah and this yeah arnold's narrating this whole thing yeah and then arnold says that no one saw the low branch hanging over the path until the cabbie's red scarf caught on it. Absalom. Absalom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then, of course, at the pace that this cabbie was driving, it was too late. Mm-hmm. And Arnold says, the horse kept pulling the carriage. Only now the reins were held by... The headless cabbie! <laughs> the headless cabbie! <laughs> and he like has a big moment, you know, in his storytelling. Yeah. But... I mean, so scary, though. Like, it yanked his head off. Yes. The scarf gets caught in a tree branch. And that's kind of the end of the next thing we know, he has no head. Correct. So the whole point is that his head was slopped off, I guess, by the Mm -hmm. scarf. It was twisted so tight. It just just took it right off. And I mean, yeah, are we, are we as the audience and Arnold's friends, as, as Arnold's audience, are we to assume that this ghostly woman is, like, plotting against cab drivers and plans to like yank off their heads is that what we're supposed to assume it's her intention Um, and then in my mind you know after just having gone through all this stuff with the green ribbon Mm -hmm. i'm like okay is this some kind of like retribution or revenge for a typical green ribbon story where the woman with the red scarf gives away her scarf and the other person loses their head I thought that was interesting if that's what they intended. Well, that's why I, I mentioned the green cloak. Yes, cause because she was I'm wearing thinking a green cloak. they may be thinking back to like, let's just let's just make the color green a big element. And they're already all up in this Washington Irving kind of yeah, they're already legend. Yeah, yeah so. exactly. We already we mentioned before he has the adventure of the German student. Yes, which is one of the earliest versions of the green ribbon. Yes, so they're already so. in that vein. So I have a hard time believing that the writers didn't intend some sort of green ribbon. Right. Connection, Something, some connection. But my issue with that is that even if this is a story of retribution or of flipping the script, sort of, yeah. like, I don't feel like she's getting justice or, like, feminist justice because yeah. she's still portrayed as an evil character. Right. So there's a lot to consider. <laughs> Personally, I don't think that it's an answer to it. I don't think it's the other side of the coin because mm-hmm. it's not justified and she's preying on innocent exactly. uh, people. Exactly. I wouldn't say it's that necessarily. But it is a male-female dynamic. I just think they're using elements of the same sort of tropes, the same yeah. something that isn't far-fetched or too crazy to a kid. Right. I think they kind of go, ooh, that's just spooky. Yeah, and I again, mean, like you said, this, this is all coming from a nine-year-old in the technical world of the yeah. story. So, I think yeah. it's just a scary story. Ooh, and I mean, it is. But. They make it. They make it plenty scary. So, but this is just the the beginning of the episode of Hey Arnold, right? So we have right. the whole rest of the episode to go. Mm-hmm. So Arnold finishes his story, and I love Gerald compliments the story, and he says that was a righteously told urban legend, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love it. It was nice. Yeah. But it's so early in the evening that the gang decides that they want to go have ice cream. Mm -hmm. And of all of them, Harold is understandably afraid and he's against this idea. He's like, and, and I think Sid even says something like, I guess it's time to go to bed. And Harold, or Ar hey, why Arnold. do I keep doing that? <laughs> Arnold's like, it's 630 or 730 or whatever. It's like early. And he's like, oh, right. <laughs> yeah, um, right. Yeah. They're going to be up till you right, know, 2 a.m. It's a sleepover. Yeah. Yeah. So Harold's all afraid. And of course, they have to go through City Park, which seems to be a play on Central Park. Yeah. To yeah. get the ice cream. Did you notice the the video store in the background? Uh, maybe. The corner behind Harold yeah. says video mm -hmm. above the front door. And I was like, cool, like a uh, old video store. You could go yeah, rent like VHS. a blockbuster. Yeah. I just, and that was, I on, that was common. That was on every corner. Just a 90s thing, yeah. That you wouldn't see today. Exactly. I thought you maybe had another Easter egg because there were a lot of buildings in the show, over the course of the show, mm -hmm. that had names of producers and writers and important figures in the crew that makes sense they would yeah. call the like the florist or whatever the stores in the background they would call them by the name of the crew which i thought was cool too. no i haven't researched any of the crew or... oh man so harold is afraid i'm afraid <laughs> i would have been in that <laughs> circumstance did you have a harold in your friend group that was like the naysayer Always that scared? didn't want to do yeah were you the scared kid i mean uh, no i wasn't the scared kid. I was the responsible kid, not the scared kid. There is a difference. I was always the responsible one. Yeah, I we, we would have like sleepovers and stuff and I just would want to go to bed. Like I was the kid that just wanted to go to sleep. Like <laughs> at a reasonable time, you know, at 2 or 3 a.m. I'm like, all right, I'm tired. No, I stayed up. I stayed up. Oh, oh no. Man. I mean, I, I didn't want to. At lock-ins, at sleepovers, I was always the last to fall asleep. I didn't trust people. <laughs> I mean, we had, we had kids that like, you know, guys that I was friends with that didn't like scary movies. Mm. But no, I mean, I never had anybody that was like a you know, a big scary chicken cat or whatever. Kind of, yeah, yeah no. scary cat. Me neither. Nothing like that. I don't think. Nothing like that. But I feel like that's a common trope. You always have the one that's like not willing to go go with it. <laughs> There's always one they can make fun of. Yeah. And I mean, you needed that in this show too for kids to relate to because it's it's spooky. If they were all super brave and like not worried about it. The audience would be like, oh, there's nothing to be afraid yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's, the uh It's representation, but it's also, yeah, exactly. It's scary because they're acting scared. Yeah. Yeah. Like in this episode, there are actually frightening elements. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, it scared me. Yeah, I would be with Harold probably on this one. At nine years old, I don't want to walk through the middle of the no. park at night after I just heard that story. No, mm -hmm. I, I would have been pretty spooked. Um, but they do. <laughs> yeah. So they enter the park and they're greeted by a Scotty dog. No, it's a demon Scotty dog. <laughs> and me watching this as a grown up, you know, rewatching it, I'm like, that's a weird coincidence. And as I thought that, Sid, the character, says, pretty weird coincidence, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like Sid. But they continue on through the darkness even after meeting this Scotty dog. And they hear this clattering sound on the cobblestone. And it sounds like a horse or a carriage. And this sound is so tied into the legend and the story. Of, and, and Arnold even mentions when he tells the story about the sound of the hooves and the, yeah. the wheels on the cobblestone, etc. So it's kind of ingrained in there. Mm -hmm. But no, it's just Eugene <laughs> practicing clogging. It's always Eugene. <laughs> always Eugene. Clogging I feel like this kind of reveal. In the early evening. <laughs> Yeah, in the middle of the park. Oh, I've seen everything. In the nighttime. I feel like this kind of reveal was very common in cartoons of the time. Yeah. Like SpongeBob did it a lot. Rugrats did it a lot. This like, yes. you think it's one thing and then the, the reveal fake out, of the, the fake the out. The psych yeah. out kind of. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's It's good fine. writing it's for good. horror. It's Eugene. Yeah, that's how, that's how horror it's, works. It's just, that's a common thing, but it, it was very, very, uh, it was used a lot. In like 90s children's entertainment. Yes. And I also have a note to ask, is this, it's, it may be the first and only perhaps time that we see Arnold's character wearing a jacket. Oh. He's wearing a jacket. And in, uh, if you know the show, they really don't change their outfits. The kids are in no. the same outfits I mean, every time we see them. I feel like I can imagine a jacket for Arnold that he wears, but. It may just be because yeah, of this episode. It, it may be one of a few. Because I just watched it. Maybe one of a few. But he definitely is wearing a jacket, which I thought was funny because they had to like emphasize just this like yeah. cold, <laughs> distant Early place. autumn evening. You know? Yeah. They, they um, had to. Yeah. They didn't change characters' costumes too much unless there was a specific reason for it. Plot reason. Uh, yeah. yeah. For the plot. So yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. It's a good, that's so, a good note. I, I thought, That'd be something to like track if I know. we were Yeah. If we did some whole, more Hey Arnold, we can the see whole show. when he changes. I'd, I'd have to watch outfit. it to know for, for certain. Yeah. 
So they, the kids journey through a tunnel in the park, just like in the story. Mm-hmm. And when they get to the end, Harold's afraid, everything's, it's scary. And when they get to the end of the tunnel, out jumps a man with a hook for an arm <laughs> and scares them all. It's a golden but hook. But actually, he's, he, he's not a man with a hook for an arm at all. He's a watch salesman and he's holding out his arm <laughs> with all the golden watches on it. So ridiculous. And in the dark, deserted park, in the fog. In the nighttime. It's a bunch of, yeah. Yeah, what's he doing out there selling watches? <laughs> Who are you selling was, watches say, to? But I mean, 30 or whatever. Yeah. It, it made me laugh, though, because like I mentioned earlier, I first went to New York City when I was 12. Yeah. And one of the things that I remember vividly from that trip is walking down the sidewalk and having, you know, the guys in trench coats walking by. And under their breath, they're like, Rolex, 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 yeah. Rolex. Just like they're selling watches. They're selling their wares. Yeah. And People it's not legal. People selling stuff on the street. They're just selling stuff. Yeah. And it's so common. So even in my like child mind, I was like, I know what that, I get it. Okay. So it definitely seems <laughs> just like a But not in the middle nod. of like. Not in the middle of the park the at nighttime. Park. Yeah, that's less Any less guy common. that costs you at the end of a bridge in like Central Park is just like a pedophile or a rapist. Yeah. For sure. Or just a person experiencing homelessness. I mean... You can't lump them all into one group. But I can, though. But yeah, still scary. Either way, you're a nine-year-old child. <laughs> That's frightening. Yeah. Or you're a 29-year-old woman, such as myself. <laughs> but the the gang then spots this red scarf dangling from a low tree branch as they're exiting the tunnel, getting away from the watch salesman. It's quite a coinky tink. And I mean, Arnold is, he's way too chill about this. Like, <laughs> he's so chill. And he was always the voice of reason. He was always the protector. He was always the calm, you know, sound-minded yeah. character, which is one of the many reasons that my anxious little heart just had such a big crush on Arnold. Sure. Always. I was very attracted to that level of calm. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, come on, football head. Like, this this one's pretty compelling. You see a, you've seen the Scotty dog. Yeah. You've seen the man with a hook for an arm. And now you see a red scarf in the tree. Like, I feel... I feel like even you should be catching on at this point, but like something's going on. He's so grounded. He's an earth sign for sure. Oh, (laughs) oh, for sure. He's definite like Taurus vibes all the way. Yeah. But they're they're approached by a horse-drawn carriage at this point, which is scary. Everybody's afraid. Everybody's freaked out because, you know, the, the carriage approaches and they see that it's driven by a headless cabbie. It's cabbie. And then they realize, oh, wait, wait, it's not. It's just one of the boarding house residents, Ernie. Ernie. And he's wearing a coat that's too big for him. Because he's so short. He's a short guy (laughs) and his his coat's just too big and it's over the top of his head and in the silhouette. So it's not a headless cabbie. It's just Ernie. And then the passenger begins to laugh maniacally like the mysterious woman. And this is scary in the darkness. But they realize, oh, oh, no, wait, it's just Mr. Wynn and... Mr. Wen is practicing his creepy laugh. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> In it's the darkness. just a creepy laugh. Yeah. Ha-ha. He's always this like catch-all. He is. Miscellaneous yes. weirdo Mr. type. Mr. Wen. Gosh. He's always yeah. there for offshoot moments of the show. That's They're true. like, we need someone to fill this gap. And Mr. it's Wen. not the it's not the only time that they play with his voice either because there's another oh, episode where right. Mr. Wen is found to be a country music genius quite and talented country music singer the voice of randy travis and like ends yeah. up on the radio and all this stuff um, oh it's so funny it's so great so yeah this isn't the only time that they 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 use his voice mm-hmm. as a device but anyway it's just ernie and mr Wynn, and ernie offers the boys a ride home and i guess they got their ice cream maybe they were licking ice cream i can't remember yeah they, they had ice cream they had so ice they cream. made, made so a quick they, stop, they made a stop and for they, ice cream they looped back around they yeah home. so they they achieved their mission their mission was a success yeah. that's the on, only reason why harold could continue on because he was really really hungry that's right he got his ice cream so everybody's got happy and after ernie drops off the boys he is met by a mysterious woman mm-hmm. who needs a ride and is looking for her missing Scotty dog. Wearing a green cloak. Wearing a green cloak. And that's and the end of scarf. the episode. <laughs> well, she yeah, she offers him a scarf. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, thanks, lady. Thanks, lady. Or whatever. And mm-hmm. it's cool because you never see her face. Never do. So you and don't know. It's it's one of our favorites. It's a spinning top kind of ending. Oh, it's perfect. You know, we've we've cycled through this story kind of twice in the episode. And then it starts over again in 
the reality of the the mm -hmm. show. But like many cartoons, Ooh. you don't ever hear about it again. It's not a continuation of any kind. So we know he show. lives. We know basically. Ernie's still around. So yeah, apparently she wasn't successful if she tried the same thing on Ernie. If you think about how he would handle and it. And he's so short that maybe he wouldn't reach the, <laughs> he's the so branch. He's so short. What if that was the joke? <laughs> that he was so short that even if his scarf did yeah. flap up to like low hanging branches. It, it wouldn't get there. Wouldn't I don't reach. think it would reach. I think that he was so That's short so, that it saved his life. so funny. Short people for the win. I'm only 5'2", y'all. I'm a short person. And sometimes it can work out to our advantage. I'm just but saying. Sometimes when you're on Space Mountain, don't you feel like you're going to hit your head still? Yeah, I still do. Yeah. I, I do. do. I'm 5'10". Don't ever I, lift I, your I arms on like Space Mountain. I've ridden it with the lights on quite arms. a few times. Never lift your arms uh. on Space Mountain. <laughs> mm -mm. But yeah, that's the episode of The Headless Cabbie. So, so I have a few more Hey Arnold things to go go over with you. Do it. Like I mentioned, I searched I searched high and low trying to see if there were connections to like ghostly women yeah. or Scotty dogs with Sleepy Hollow. Like you'd asked about the black dog and, you know, black dog is an omen of death. I do think that was right. probably their intention, but there is nothing specific about Scottish Terriers other than the fact that it's a Scottish Terrier and it was Irish Scottish legend yeah. that it all was born from. So I did that's the only thread that made sense. Yeah. But in looking through all of that, the only legend that came up repeatedly when looking for women and ghosts and Sleepy Hollow was the legend of the Bronze Lady. Do you know this one? I don't know that I do. Okay. Please. So tell I will me. go with one Sleepy Hollow story for you. We'll leave the rest for another time. Okay. But there isn't a statue in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery outside the mausoleum of a Civil War general named Samuel Thomas. Okay. And this statue is very, very, very popular local legend through like the 60s, 70s, 80s with local children. Um, there are lots of different iterations of it, but the baseline is that this statue, it's a woman that's a very sad woman mm -hmm. across from the general's mausoleum. Sounds like my kind of lady. She is bad news, which also sounds like sounds kinda like lady. my kind of lady. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, she <laughs> will curse different iterations. Some people say if you get into her lap. Some people say if you touch her face. Some people say if you touch her face and then you look through the keyhole of the mausoleum, then you're cursed. Interesting. There are lots of ways to be cursed by her or to have negative things happen to you because of her. You'll have bad luck if you touch her kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the story of the statue, uh, it was commissioned by Anne Thomas, who was the wife of General Samuel Thomas that's buried there. Yeah. And when the statue was revealed and she looked so sad, Ann Thomas was dissatisfied with the statue and was like, I was not, this wasn't what I pictured telling the sculptor. Mm. She was like, you know, that could, is she's just so sad all the time. I and hated my husband. I wanted her to be <laughs> rejoicing. <laughs> Honestly, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, but she said she wanted the statue to look happier or more content. And so the sculptor – Rejoicing. Legend yes. says the sculptor made a new head for the statue that looked happier. Ooh. And Anne approved this head. But the artist then threw it to the ground and shattered the happy head and said he would never change his, his work. He would never – put this head on the statue which very dramatic like did you really have to go to the length of making it to then yeah that sounds off yeah but apparently this is what happened sounds wrong and Anne herself was entombed there at the same mausoleum in 1944 she lived to be almost 100 years old just like betty white and r.i.p i know god r.i.p betty white can't believe it took us this long to, talk, to say that <laughs> days shy oh days days shy of 100 wonderful woman beautiful but soul the sad bronze lady statue still remains in the sleepy Betty Hollow bronze cemetery. <laughs> no 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 god sorry. this woman <laughs> clearly was not on the level of betty white in any way no, shape no, or form no. but nobody she, ever will be nobody ever will be can't can't fill those shoes but yeah this bronze lady is apparently very common in the local children circles um, and I thought it was cool that it was through the through the 80s. Like kids in the yeah. 80s would go to the cemetery and like dare each other to like sit in her lap or touch her face or oh, whatever. That's wild. Yeah. And that's cool. Apparently people say that if you walk in the cemetery at night, now there are like lantern guided tours and stuff. It's become a lot more like commercialized, which I'd still love to go. Uh, but what's stopping us? <laughs> nothing. The pandemic. No. Uh, Omicron. Freaking pandemic is stopping us from doing so many things. If you could stop bleeding. If, yeah. If I could just stop bleeding and the pandemic could stop raging, then maybe we could do something. Hey, but stuff. we're both boosted, so we might as well. We are boosted. Got that, that 5G true. boost mobile. <laughs> love to go to Sleepy Hollow. 
and see the cemetery. Yeah. But people say that you can hear her crying or over the years you've been able to hear her crying. Dude. So let's do it. Yeah. That's creepy. That Isn't is so that creepy. creepy? Ugh. 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 But t- back to more Hey Arnold stuff. We've touched on a lot of this already, just talking about the realism of the show. They talked about this in the interview as well, but this show just did things that most shows were not doing at the time, and they addressed life as it was and as it is now. Um, they didn't throw softballs because it was a kid's show. They they made it real. Yeah. In that Up Rocks interview, they, they said that they took inspiration from dark comedies of the 70s. And they brought those up all the time when they were making Hey Arnold because they wanted the dark comedic element. They wanted the realism of life. They didn't want to shy away from it. They wanted it to add to the comedy of the show. But it also adds to the heart of the show at the same time. It was a very emotional show. It was. It really was. Joe Purdy was one of the writers. And (laughs) a quote from him, he said... (laughs) We definitely got too dark. We were given lots of notes by Nickelodeon about, remember, it's a kid's show. And he said that they explored Ernie's psyche and Big Bob's and Miriam, who seemed to have a little problem. Mm-hmm. Um, they made yeah. her, like, she was an alcoholic. Uh, so Kaylin was... Uh, I was miming a drink. Miming drinking. <laughs> she had a little a little problem. I am not miming drinking. You're doing whiskey. it. But I don't have a quote-unquote little problem. <laughs> No, not a little one. (laughs) Not an alcoholic. Oh, man. Uh, To continue with Joe's quote, he said, (laughs) All of the dark episodes would balance with a silly story in the same episode. But they, he said, we actually scrapped a lot of really dark stories because they were too dark. Oh. There were some Ernie episodes that were made tamer than originally pitched oh about Ernie's love life. And they scrapped a couple of darker stories with Miriam, who's held his mom. I want to see me too. These episodes. Me too. And this is, yeah, here's where I listed some of the other scary episodes. Ghost Bride, yeah. Haunted Train, Oof. Lee's and Ed, Oof. Pigeon Man. Pigeon there Man. are so many episodes that we can cover. So I won't turn over every Hey Arnold stone yet. Right. But I would like to leave with a note that co-producer Joseph and Sol- and Solabir, in the interview, he said, Arnold was kind of weird, and Nick didn't want that word weird ever used. Hmm. But to us, he was the guy who we all know, who we all feel inside of us, that we're the outsider, that we're kind of strange, but embracing that. Yeah. He said, so at one point, we were struggling with this, and this was, we were struggling with this once the show was going, because Nick was saying, we don't know who Arnold is. And one day we just thought, it's Craig. (laughs) That's who Arnold is. He's Craig. He's a guy who uses his inner artistic abilities to get through life and be successful. And I'm like, me too. Us too. That's me. (laughs) That's no wonder I related so much. No wonder this is my favorite cartoon. Totally makes sense. Wow. And in response to this, Craig Bartlett said that Helga could speak for Arnold to the audience about how awesome he is. Yeah. And that the audience would learn how much that she loved Arnold and they would love Arnold too. And it totally worked. Of course. Yeah. And he says when he sees what adult fans have to say about it now, they love they love the show. They love Arnold in part because Helga loves Arnold. Yeah. It wove into the narrative so deeply that, like, the character that the show's based on and whose perspective that you're mostly seeing, we also see another character that is totally enamored by him. And it worked so well for a child audience, but, you know, the adults of today that remember the show. Yeah, it does work. Yeah, I had a crush. And I didn't have a crush on him because Helga had a crush on him, but it did make it easier to have a crush on him. You know, it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. Yeah. It was like, yeah, that makes sense. On the flip side of that, I, I wanted to be Arnold, but I was always like, man, I, I, I wonder if there's anybody who has a super secret crush on me. Like a big, <laughs> big deal. You wanted a Helga that had a shrine to you? Kind of. But I was like, <laughs> if I have a Helga, let it be like a girl I like. Right. And see, but even, but that's the thing. even the thought of Helga was like kind of nice though. Yeah. No, it's a Helga that's nice because the Helga is the friend that's always there. Like they're always, they always end up right. in that same space together. They always end up understanding each other. He understood her in a way no one else did either. Yeah. Or he, he would take the time to, to talk to her and yeah, ask I was her what say, was going was on, even to. though she was a bitch to him yeah. and to everyone. Buzz is yelling now. Both my cats really wanted to be part of this. <laughs> my cats are asleep. Yeah, I 2022. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like it was nice. Yeah. And I think he found it nice too. Just like Lane Torin said, like, I think eventually he would have come to realize how valuable that was to always have had her in his corner, even if she didn't act like it. 
always. Right. And it wasn't always outwardly apparent, but th- there was always this person that understood him and he understood her. Mm-hmm. And that was like, it was just magical. <laughs> As a kid, I thought it was the greatest thing. I feel that way now. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a secret crush on Christian. If anybody has a secret crush on me, make it not so secret. Let's do this. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, it's nice. It's a nice thought. Oh, you have you have so many crushes that are even some <laughs> secret, so. some not secret. Please. If you have a bubblegum shrine with my head, like, don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm talking about sweet crushes yeah no and some that are not sweet crushes but they're not quite helga yeah that's true there's a difference between a sweet crush and a not sweet <laughs> crush i guess there are selfless crushes and selfish oh crushes. oh that's what it is that's way better yes because yes 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 you can have selfish and selfless feelings yes reminds me of pacey and joey on dawson's creek where <laughs> pacey is like at the end when it f- comes down to the finale and they've had these years of back and forth and the finale is like 10 years in the future and Pacey says to her, the simple act of being in love with you is enough for me. Like that's all he needs. And that's all Helga needs too. <laughs> like it's just, that's just what it is. This is, this is what it is. This is how it motivates me in my life. That's all I need. And that is the type of crush. Yes. That's so selfless. That's just like, it just is what it is. Sure. I love that. You guys are getting all my hopeless romantic <laughs> vibes in this Hey Arnold. I would expect nothing less from a Hey oh, Arnold man. episode. And she's not oh. even in this episode. And, yeah, and Helga's not even in this episode. <laughs> um, but I ended up watching almost a full season of Hey Arnold as I was preparing because I watched this episode a couple times and then I just kind of let it play because yeah. I was like, this is entertaining. And I was laid up sure. with anxiety and health issues. Uh, for a lot of the time I was doing these notes. And so I just watched a lot of it and it drew me in the same way it did when I was a kid. It was so, it's so good. uh, Pleasant to watch. It holds up. (laughs) It It holds holds up. up. It truly does. It lives. It truly does. As we, as we say, sometimes it lives. And as I keep saying, we'll leave some stones unturned for next time because we've got a lot more Hey Arnold. Yep. But overall, I'm grateful that the show exists. I'm impressed by the way that they were able to, Includes so much reality yeah. and so much darkness, sure. even at self-admitted, you know, darkness in a way that endeared us and didn't repel us. Yeah. And that's what we aim to do with a lot of the things that we make as well. Right. To portray that in a way that is endearing is a whole nother level of making art. And I love it. <laughs> endearing, realistic darkness. Yes. Couldn't ask for more. So that is the Headless Cabbie. That is our first Hey Arnold episode. Do you the have any cabbie. other thoughts? <sighs> Man, let me see. I wouldn't know. Well, I guess I guess the main question still lingering for me is something that you sort of touched on early. What are we to assume yeah. this woman's intentions are? Don't know. Because if we look at some of the historical context, you have this uh, demon uh, cabbie type carriage. Mm-hmm. You have this female slash banshee, maybe. Yeah. You have a dog, the Scotty dog. A black Dog. So anyway, it's just a lot of this uh, overlapping old world mythologies. It's all weaving together, but it's it's exactly what we're doing here. It's it's how it all intertwines to then create the legend that creates the cartoon that creates mm-hmm. the memory in mm-hmm. our head. You know, exactly here in 2022 when we're adult people. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. Again, every time, over and over, over and over. I really like finding those threads, though. I think yes. it's really cool. And I think it's interesting that just the stuff that we've, like we mentioned in the the New Year's episode, we have so many topics that we plan to cover. And it's so interesting that we, we find ways that they intersect, too. Yeah. And I, I mean, I knew that that would be part of this, doing the show, but it is... It's pretty wild. It's pretty uncanny to see exactly how much intersection there actually is with all of the entertainment from this time period. It really and is. I'm sure you could do it with entertainment from any time period, but you know, we're millennial yeah, and sure, we're talking sure. about how it messed us up. So, right. yeah, it's there for the taking, and yeah. we're here to take it, like women riding in the back of a cab about to take the cabbie's head. <laughs> but was she taking the heads? Yeah, we. Just, we just, I don't it's know. Unclear. That's the thing. It's She's unclear. is she working next to this? A uh, little scuddy dog. You do have to understand and assume, like you mentioned, she's undead. This Arnold's story was a hundred years ago, and then so how did she die? And that's the thing. Why is was she doing it this? a green ribbon situation? Is she getting revenge? That's why it kind of I don't know. 
you know, was interesting to me with the scar. And how many heads are they finding in City Park? <laughs> how many cabbies <laughs> yeah. are losing their heads on a regular basis? Over the decades. Maybe it's like, uh, you know how there's like recurring every Halloween night this happens or, you know, re- recurring legend. An early Maybe autumn it's like evening that. when yeah. the fog he said the fog, the f- you know, mm-hmm. a night lowers. much like this one, the fog is low. Yeah. You know, maybe it's like an annual or every decade or something. What date was this episode released on? Um, <laughs> hang on, I'll find it. Oh, oh, yeah. This episode aired on October 30th, 1999. It was Halloween so, Mischief Night. Mischief night. <laughs> it was Halloween, the Halloween, se- <laughs> Halloween season. Halloween season. Halloween episode. Mischief it clearly night. aired on like Halloween 1999. So. And I would not be surprised if I watched it the night it came out. Oh, yeah. Same. I can't be certain. I know it scared me when I was a kid. Yeah. And for it to have been released at that time of the year. Oh, yeah. I, I was looking to get spooked for sure. Same. So, a hundred heads in City Park somewhere. Mm-hmm. Potentially. Potentially. Potentially like 10. I knows? think, yeah. If it's successful. Once a year for a hundred years? Yeah, I mean, she didn't get Ernie, so... I bet it doesn't work that often. I bet you have to be a real dumbass for that to work. <laughs> and real tall. So probably, <laughs> or very tall, so probably like 10, 15 heads. Maybe. That's still a lot of heads. I feel like heads. that's like, hey, Arnold, the untold story. That's still a lot of heads. Like, that's like, that's gotta be a whole documentary, a docuseries yeah. on all the heads, the heads of City in Park. City Park, outside of <laughs> Arnold's house, like a few blocks mm. away. These are the stories we didn't hear. These are the stories that were masked. Like I mentioned, they talked about Miriam being an alcoholic, but yeah. as a kid, I knew something was <laughs> off about her. I more thought it was like pills. Yeah. As a kid, I don't know why, but I thought she was just like medicated for something and was subdued in that way. But she was always drinking, if you notice in the show. Yeah. She was always drinking smoothies and stuff. Oh, man. Coffee. Margaritas. It Irish wasn't coffee. apparently. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't always smoothies or coffee. Well, we've cracked the code again. Here we are. Cracking codes. There's so much there to figure out. <laughs> hey, Arnold has a serial killer. Wow. There, I it's mean, a woman. We could go into so many. But is things. it a ghost woman or is it generations of the same woman's oh, family? Yeah. It could be that too. These are questions we can't answer. Mm-mm. We would have to talk to craig let's get old craig let's get craig on the show oh, i want to pick his brain i'd love to not literally craig if you're ever listening to this like i said this is my love letter to your show it made me who i am <laughs> first of many love letters that he'll never respond to <laughs> but maybe he'll respond one day okay I, i'll be the hell go i guess <laughs> just craig barlett <laughs> <laughs> oh no, god i'm not there cool so that's all you got? That's what I got. That's the Headless Cabbie. That's the Headless Cabbie. Well, thanks for lending your ears to our new, yes, our first episode of 2022. To our first 2022 episode. <sighs> if we haven't, I mean, we've touched on it, but if we haven't said for certain, we successfully recorded and released 13 episodes our oh, yeah. first year. I don't know if we said it, but yeah. It wasn't not, intentional. It wasn't intentional. We just did, the, like, it, it just happened to be 13 We just episodes. knew we wanted to start the first Saturday in October, so we did, and it turned out to be... 13 episodes so we feel pretty special we're big fans of serendipity around here so Mm -hmm. we liked that so hope you're having a great beginning of your new year stay safe i truly hope that your year started better than mine did i think everyone started better than yours (laughs) passing out well not everyone (laughs) not everyone we know a couple people who had worse new years than yours but hopefully not many of you stay safe stay vaccinated wear your mask take care of yourselves yeah and we will come at you again soon And we look forward to it. Yeah. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to That's Pretty Dark. Written and produced by Christian Baxter Mott and Kaylin Andrews. Our music is composed by Jonathan Simmons. And our art is provided by Paige Garland at Power Girl Illustration. Join the collective nostalgia and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at That's Pretty Dark Podcast. Share your experiences and let us know what shows, films, or villains still haunt you from childhood at That's Pretty Dark Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, you're never really alone. So, until next time, sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>